And would you bow your heads with me for prayer? Jesus, please come. We want to talk about you, but more than that, we want to know you. This isn't just a talk, this is to come to know, and to know you as eternal life. So would you come tonight? Holy Spirit, please, as you've been promised by Jesus to come, would you come? Fill our hearts, fill our minds, facilitate the communication, and move us where you need to move us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin in John chapter 21. We'll put most of our text on the screen because it will allow us to move very quickly, but you're always welcome to follow along in Scripture as well. John 21, Jesus, uh, he's resurrected, and you know he kind of did the now you see him, now you don't think for about 40 days before the ascension. He'd pop into the disciples' lives here and there. And uh, as we're told in John 21, one night uh, up in Galilee, half a Half a dozen disciples decided they didn't have anything else to do. They'd go fishing. And they fished all night and caught nothing. And in the morning, they look over on shore. There's a figure over there in the early morning light. They can't tell who it is, but that figure does what everybody does. When they talk to fishermen, did you catch anything? My grandma, my grandma Vinden, um, she owned property out on the Cowleyman River out of uh, Kelso Longview. My dad grew up in Kelso Longview in Vancouver. It's about 15 miles out through Rose Valley. Last phone on the road, so all the drunks would come by when they ran off the road for the road. <laughs> she kept a 22 behind the door, and she used it, but not on anybody, just to scare them. But uh, I remember she was a fisher lady. She could go out to the river to her favorite spot. People would stand around all day and not catch a thing. She'd go in, catch her limit, and go home. But what do you always say? Did you catch anything? And so the man on the shore says, did you catch anything? And they say no. And he says, well, why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat? Now that should have brought some memories, right? About three years before, they didn't catch anything. And that, three years before, they got two boatloads of fish, and then he told them to leave them all. So they throw the net on the other side, and this time, I love it, somebody's a bean captain. 153 fish. And Peter immediately dives in the water. He wants to get near Jesus and swims to shore. The rest come dragging the nets and all the fish. And Jesus says, well, bring some more fish. I don't know where he got the first fish, but he says, we've got hungry men here. Let's bring some more fish. And they put more fish on the, on the fry there. They had a fish fry for breakfast. And when breakfast is over, Jesus looks at Peter and he asks him questions. When they'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then the second time he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. A third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter's grieved now. Why doesn't Jesus believe what he's saying? Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus says, feed I've preached on this a number of times in the past, and it's just phenomenal what Jesus does here. He takes Peter, who has been completely and totally disgraced to himself and to the other disciples. John heard it, right? There's a witness. He is denied with oaths that he even knows Jesus. He's a complete washout. And yet here, in front of all the other disciples, Jesus lets Peter undo every one of those denials. And then in front of all the disciples, Jesus looks at Peter as if to say, and he says essentially this, Peter, you are still my man. And to the rest of the disciples, get this guys, he's still my man. He's on the team. Tremendous validation goes on here that sets Peter up for the rest of his life. But that's not really the point I want to get out of this section tonight. I want to just zero in on Jesus' question. What's his question? Do you love me? Have you ever asked that question? That's a scary question. What if you get the wrong answer? Right? I mean, how did we do it in third grade? 
we asked our friend to ask her friend to ask her if she liked us, right? Because it was just too scary to go face to face on this thing. And of course, I think we've all heard the story of, you know, the woman at their anniversary, 25, 30, 40 years, whatever, looks at her husband and says, do you love me? What does he say? I told you I loved you on the day I married you. Why do I have to say it again? I'm good for my word. Because we need to hear it. But I want you to notice, Jesus asked, do you love me? And usually when we go to scripture and we look at our theology and our beliefs and all, we try to get people to accept Jesus. We try to get people to understand that he loves us. We try to get people to accept his love for us. But here we're looking at the flip side of that question where Jesus isn't saying, do you know that I love you? Jesus is saying that vulnerable question, do you love me? Now when somebody asks, do you love me? What are they really asking? Are they asking, do you need me? Is that the core? No. No, what's the core? Do you desire me? You're not asking, do you need what I do? Or do you need what I have? Or do you desire what I do and desire what I have? You're asking, do you desire me? And you know, most of us have a hard time believing that if people really knew us, they'd want us. Right? That's the core of the human problem. Does God need to know we love Him? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now one thing love is not, it's not a commodity that you can put on a shelf. You know, we had a quart of love up there, let's get down, pour a cup of it and see what happens. The only time love exists is when it is, in, it is as an engaged relationship between two people or more. Love exists as a relationship. Without a relationship, love doesn't happen. It's interactive in its very nature. So when it says that God is love, if God is the ultimate love, the ultimate lover, not just that he has love and is loving, but he is love, he is love to the core of his very being. The more you are engaged in love, the more you need others to love you. Not just you to love them. Now the cool thing about agape love in scripture is it's unilateral. God is going to love me. God is going to love you whether you ever love him back at all, ever. He's never going to stop loving you. But he, by the nature of who he is, he is love. He needs us to love him back. One of the, one of the most diabolical um, doctrines I know of that's been taught down through the years, um, through the centuries about God, is what's called the immutability of God. Now the immutability of God is, is kind of this, I'm not going to put it theologically, um, but it's, it's kind of like this. Is God total? Is God all? Can we add anything to God? If we could add something to God, it would mean God isn't total, which means, can we really count on Him to be whatever we need Him to be? But the flip side of that is if God is total, then you can't add anything to God. You can't make God happier or less happy. You can't affect Him positive or negative because He's total. And the problem is, if you take that to its logical end, you can't matter to God. Is God total? Yes. Is God total? Yes. Yes. He's all. Is God love? Yes. Uh -huh. So even though God is total, can he be affected? Yes. See, I believe when we look at the the uh, two seemingly incompatible things that God is total, and yet God is affectable because he is love. It's, it's two incompatible truths 
But it helps us look into the infinite. Yes, he's told them. Yes, he needs our love. He desires our love. He wants us. I'll say this a number of times in a number of ways this week. He doesn't just want us to be good. He wants us. He wants relationship with us. God may be total, but I believe because God is love, we know then that we can affect God. Have you noticed how love works? You could be totally in love today, and you could be even more in love tomorrow without having been less in love yesterday. You got that? Yeah. Just think about that. You can love that person more and more and more, and yet you never really love them less. Love is a thing that can just get better and better without ever having been worse. I think love is how we actually can tap into the infinite because we're going to love more and more throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity and the brain's never going to get the blue screen, you know. Memory is full, as far as you can go. We'll be able to love more and more forever and it will just get totaler without having been lesser. Does that make sense? God is love. So he can even expand even though he's already total. Because that's the incredible nature of love. Love always wants to expand the circle of love. The Bible says, God said in Genesis 1.26, let us make Adam, the word man in your Bible there, in the Hebrew is the word Adam, believe it or not. Let us make Adam in our image according to our likeness. Why did God make human beings? Did he need partners and servants and people to stand around and tell him how great he is all the time? Why did he make us? Love always desires to expand the circle of love. Love touches the infinite. God wanted more kids. He wanted more people to be in relationship. He didn't make us to be pets. You know, you talk to your dog, but the conversation coming back is not very deep. God didn't make us to be pets. He made us in his image. Now, I don't think that necessarily means God has fingers and toes, but one thing I believe it absolutely has to mean, he gave us, he made us with the capacity to actually interact with him on an intelligibly equal level. Not that we're as smart as he is, but to have real communication, conversation, give and take. He made us to have a relationship with him. And the Lord God said, it's not good that Adam, is the word there again, it's not good that Adam should be alone, I'll make him a helper comparable to him. Here, here we get into the, uh, the same concept again. Was anything bad yet? This is before sin, nothing was bad. And yet God said it's not good. See, we only know good and bad. We don't know good and gooder. Total and total. So when God says it's not good that Adam should be alone, nothing was bad yet, he just had something even better. It's not good that Adam should be alone. Now if God is love, and we're made in the image of God, if that's the core of who he is, that's got to be the core of who we are. And yet Adam is alone. So how can Adam be experiencing love when it's welling in him like it does in God, when there's no lover? God said, this isn't good. Now, I think he did it on purpose because he wanted Adam to sense the need and then he fulfilled that need in a way that would be really exciting to Adam. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. Now, that, that word there for helper, um, every other place in the Old Testament that word is used, it's used for God coming through in a life-saving role. Not just helping you, you know, uh, move from here to there, but saving your life. God says, I will make him a life-saving counterpart. A strengthening counterpart. Okay? Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every cruel living creature, that was its name. He gave names to the cattle, the birds, the beasts, but for Adam, there was not found this strengthening counterpart. 
So God deliberately let Adam discover every other species had two that were same opposites. They fit together, didn't fit with anyone else. And then he looked around and he didn't have anybody. Now, could Adam have been perfectly happy and had a wonderful life for the Cecil saints of eternity, just he and God? I have to say yes. God is enough. But God says, I give you that more. I give you that more. And so once he let Adam discover his aloneness, his he began to feel this love thing, but there was nothing to do with it. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Now that word rib is nowhere else in the Bible used for an anatomical bone. It is always and only used for one side of the room or the other, one side of the ark or the other, one side of the mountain or the other. So did God take a rib or did God take a side? All we know is that when Adam woke up, he wasn't half the man he used to be, right? And then he looked around, and there she was coming back. The part that he was missing. Out of the rib the Lord God had taken from Adam, he made a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam began writing poetry. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, she shall be taken out. Because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Creation. Well, this is a romance. Do you notice that? You take two beautiful people, you put them in a beautiful garden naked. <laughs> this is a romance, right? God made lovers, and he desired to be part of the loving circle. But then something happened. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. What does that mean? Cunning does not mean genius. Cunning means incredibly gorgeous and intelligent. If you would have wanted a pet in the Garden of Eden, you would have chosen a snake. That's hard for us to believe now. But God lowered their status significantly. We don't know what they were like in the first place. Except they were the most beautiful, intelligent creation God had made, besides human beings. And the Lord had made this serpent, and the serpent now uh, is talking. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The word indeed there, Leslie Harding, an old British scholar that I knew briefly. He was very old when I was very young. Um, he uh, said that word indeed there, probably could best be translated, huh? Huh? Has God said, have you ever met somebody and they seem like a really nice person and you're kind of excited about getting to know them and then you talk to somebody else and say, hey, I just, I just met George and I, I think he's a really great guy and they go, huh? <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it goes from color to black and white. So he goes, huh, has God, has God said you can't eat of these trees? The woman said, no, we can eat of the fruit of all the trees of the garden except for one you're in. We shall not eat it or touch it lest we die. And the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. What happened at the tree? Now this is going to be foundational to everything we talk about in this series. What happened at the tree? Did Adam and Eve do anything bad at the tree. Think. Is eating bad? No. I hope not. Thanks for the soup supper. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it. You know, and if I preach too long on Sabbath morning, everyone's waiting for lunch. Nothing wrong with eating. Was there anything wrong with the fruit? No. The text is clear. The fruit looked good. Well, let's, let's actually go to the next verse. The woman saw that the fruit was good for food, right? God didn't make stinky fruit on that tree. He didn't make a hamburger tree to give you hardly the arteries, right? It was good fruit. My guess is there was probably other trees with the same fruit. Nothing wrong with the fruit, nothing wrong with eating, so what was wrong? I always say they disobeyed God. Oh, so now we have a God who goes around making trivial rules, telling you not to do perfectly not decent things, perfectly good things, in order to test you and catch you. 
I have a little problem with that view of God. That doesn't sound like something a person who is loved to the core would do. So what was wrong with the tree? Only one thing that I can come up with was wrong at the tree, and it had nothing to do with their behavior. And this is fundamental to our entire series together. Adam and Eve did not do a bad deed at the tree. They didn't break anything. They didn't hurt anybody. They didn't kill anything. They didn't steal anything. They didn't break any of the Ten Commandments. Except they broke up with God and ran off with a talking snake. The point is, at the tree, the sin, the original sin was not a bad deed. It was a breaking of relationship, which has led to horrendously bad deeds ever since. Does that make sense? The original sin is not a bad deed. The original sin is the breakdown of relationship between human beings and God. We ran off with another lover on the honeymoon. The original sin was not about behavior. The original sin was about a broken relationship. Have you ever experienced the pain of breakup? Which means you have to think about your first love. Anybody able to remember back that far? It's getting a long time for me. You know, in sixth grade or so, or fifth grade, if the teacher said, let's all get in a circle now and hold hands and play a game, if you were a little boy, you didn't want to be standing by the little girl because she had cooties, right? So maybe you just give one finger, and as soon as the teacher would say, okay, you can let go now, you, you know, try to... And yet, somewhere along the line, probably moving closer to seventh and eighth grade, that view began to shift with us guys, if you remember. In fact, the idea of holding hands with a girl began to take on kind of living color, if you know what I mean. And, and do you remember the first time you held hands, guys or gals, with, with one of the opposite sex? You know, it's, it's kind of hard to remember just how it happened, but you know, you put your hand on your knee and kind of leaned it to the right, and she put her hand on her knee and kind of leaned it to the left, and somehow your hands touched, and you don't know really what happened, but all of a sudden you're holding hands, right? And life surged through your being like you've never felt it before. This is life. The endorphin rush was incredible. Do you remember? What about your first kiss? For me, it was eighth grade. It was Sheila. I was at her house. We were watching the movie Exodus. And it was a little TV sitting maybe four feet away against the wall, away from the dining room table. So in order to watch, you had to sit on the floor, almost under the table, which was kind of convenient. And all I remember is it was during his S commercial. And somehow lips met under the table, and life happened. You remember that? Oh, my sakes. i got to have more of this. And then the problem was that was two weeks before the end of the school year, and I was leaving town, probably never to come back. And you don't know, the, you, you don't know how the joy of that first kiss could be followed by so much pain of having to leave, right? Remember the pain of that first breakup? You know, for me, I'm moving away, it's summer, and Bobby Vinton is singing, it's you know, though it's got to be goodbye for the summer, baby, I promise you this, I'll send you my love every day in a letter soup with a kiss, right? Oh, it's going to be a cold, lonely summer, but I'll fill the emptiness. I'll send you my dreams every day in a letter soup with a kiss. And the violins come in, and the backup vocals come in, and it feels so bad, and it feels so good to feel so bad. I, it's, we're, we're strange. And of course, you can't tell your parents when you're that age, because your mother is going to say something like, well, there are more fish in the sea, right? And, and they're not going to understand at all. You're only 14. What is the problem? Or worse yet, they'll ask, what have you been doing? And then you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> the next year, um, I moved, uh, actually did my freshman year at Auburn Academy. When I got to the academy, 
They have the hands-off policy. Anybody remember that, if you're old enough? What does the hands-off policy mean? No touching. No holding hands, no hugging, and certainly no kissing, which means life is all about getting around those rules. <laughs> and I met Susie. And it wasn't too long I had a chance to kiss Susie. And she had chap lips, and I never dated her again. <laughs> I have no idea what happened to Susie. If I ever see her, I'm going to get on my knees and apologize for being a real so-and-so. <laughs> Sophomore year was Pam. Oh, she was from Texas. I was at Sandy View Academy near Albuquerque. And when we broke up, I remember, do you remember what you tried to do when somebody broke up with you? You try to find a chance to talk to them. Maybe you can talk them out of it. And so I finally cornered Pam at some point, and, and I talked to her for a few minutes, and then she walked away and sent a friend saying, don't ever talk to me again. Do oh. you remember, did you ever have this? You have been dating a gal or guy for a while, and you sit down next to them one evening, and they come over nice and close. And she hangs on, and she says, um, I think we should just be friends. <laughs> What does that mean? <clears throat> From now on, don't talk to me, don't pay any attention to me, but certainly don't come up to me when I'm with somebody else. Don't have anything to do with me, we are just friends. God understands the pain of breakup. And what did God try to do when Adam and Eve broke up? The same thing we tried to do. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid, that's what happened, you know. I try to talk to Pam and she's hiding from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called out to Adam and said, where are you? Now when God calls and asks questions, he doesn't need information. He wants you to think about what's going on. I heard your voice in the garden, Adam says, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Why would Adam be afraid? Had God ever done anything mean? You know, this fear thing, the fear, the shame, and the blame just kind of automatically come popping out of this broken relationship thing. God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded that you should not eat? And now the man says, that woman that I was just writing poetry about a few days ago, and so happy you gave her to me, she's the one who caused all the problems. She gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what have you done? She said, it's the serpent's fault, and God cursed the serpent. Notice verse 14, he cursed the serpent, and then verse 15, he says, but I will do whatever it takes to solve the problem you have caused. That's what God says. He comes to try to talk to us, and we hide. And when he does talk to us, he says, I'll take care of whatever it is. I want you to notice, he did not curse Eve, he did not curse Adam. He only cursed the serpent and the ground. The next verse that some people say was the curse, but it's not a curse. God said, I'll multiply your sorrow and your conception. This is to the woman in pain you'll bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband and he'll rule over you. I don't believe this is God's will. I believe this is God's desire. I believe this is God saying, here are the consequences of the relationship. You ran off with the wrong lover and life will not be good with that lover. Here's what's going to happen, ladies. You're going to have, your major troubles in life are going to be with men and children. Has that been true? <laughs> and then God looked at Adam and said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree, cursed is the ground, and toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your face shall be bread until you return to the ground. Men, you're going to wear yourselves out trying to provide. And I think God's been pretty accurate there too. I don't believe for a minute this is what God wants, what God wills. He's saying, when you run off with this wrong lover, there are consequences. Did you ever, any of you who are older who had teenagers, see that teenager choose somebody that you knew was going to break their hearts and hurt them? And yet every time you tried to talk them out of running off with that person, they just thought you were being mean and controlled. God is not angry, he's not cursing us, he's not punishing, he's declaring what's going to happen because he knows the end from the beginning. 
This whole story is a romance. It's not about law and behavior. It's about romance and relationship. And what went wrong with the human race was not bad deeds. It was a broken relationship with God. Philip Yancey wrote a book a number of years ago called Disappointment with God. And in that book he talks about that he, uh, up in Colorado in the middle of the winter, he got somebody to loan them his, their cabin. And he went up to that cabin for two weeks alone because he wanted to read the Bible through from beginning to end uninterrupted in a two-week period. Now the reason he said he wanted to do that is he wanted to kind of see the peaks and the highlights. He kind of wanted to get a broad, fast overview. Um, I remember back when I was in eighth grade, I was up at Auburn Academy going to Buena Vista there, and my dad took a job the second half of the year over in Pasco Kennewick teaching music, because um, they had a need in mid-year that showed up. And I remember I finally talked Dad the last nine weeks of school to let me go over and go to school to Pasco Kenna. Why I met Sheila? Why, of course, I wanted to go over there. Anyway, um, we would rent a plane. There was an architect that lived up there in Auburn, and, and he had a Piper Comanche. We would rent that plane when it was sunny, which was pretty rare, to fly over the Cascades. And I remember one day it was perfectly sunny, total. And so we took that plane up to 17,000 feet going past Mount Rainier because we wanted to look down on Mount Rainier too. As I looked, have you, have you flown over the Cascades on a sunny day? It looks like a pincushion, just rugged. And yet, rising above, you know, Baker, Rainier, um, St. Helens before she blew back then, and Adams, and, and Hood. You know, we're up there, we could see all these mountains, but these certain ones stuck up, amazing, beautiful. And that's what Yancey wanted to go up there and find out. He wanted to read the Bible through and see what were the major points that came up. And, and he says in the book, he says essentially what he discovered is he feels that the Bible is one attempt, one effort after another of God seeking to restore the relationship between himself and humankind. God is looking for friends. He's trying to get close. And he's saying, do you love me? And our answer isn't always very satisfying, is it? God makes this beautiful place, these beautiful people, to love and enjoy. He's anticipating a beautiful relationship, and on the honeymoon, they run off with another lover. And the problem is, when you break up with the one who is actually your source of life, what's going to happen? You see, when God says, if you eat of the tree, you'll die, he's not saying, if you eat of the tree, I'll kill you. The results will be death. We're going to be talking more about that. If the light bulb managed to separate itself from the light socket, is there any anger because the light goes out? That light is put out? No, it's just it's a natural consequence. You separate the power from the bulb and the light goes out. You, if you run off with another lover and your lover was the first one was the one giving you life, you're going to die. And God knows the pain of breakup and he also knows the pain of knowing that the person you're running off with is going to hurt you and eventually kill you. <clears throat> Do you remember what rejection feels like? You apply for the job, somebody else gets it. There's a cutback, or you're cut loose. Your fiance breaks the engagement, or maybe you're married and your spouse says they don't want to be married to you anymore. I remember being in grade school. I was never the athlete, I was a musician. You know, you're standing against the fence in fifth grade, and you know, the two jocks of the class are picking teams, and you know, you're the Last one standing by the fence. And they said, well, okay, I guess we'll take Vin, and we'll probably lose, but you can come on our side, you know. And boy, the feelings of rejection. You're not invited to the party, and all you, the rest of your friends are. You're wanting to go to the banquet or the prom. You ask someone, they say no, and you go by yourself and choose with somebody else. You audition for the music group or a part of the play, you get passed over, undesired, unincluded. God knows the pain of being rejected better than any of us ever have known. He says, do you love me? And we throw tomatoes. Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. 
Jesus comes back three times, Peter, do you love me? When you ask someone that question, it's risky, it's vulnerable, but you want to know if you are desired. It's the nature of love. Peter, do you love me? The creator of the universe asking, do you love me? A little bit before that, Jesus is riding into the city on a donkey. And as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. And I don't think this was just a few sniffles, because listen to his words. If you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden for your eyes. The days will come when you will when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. This sounds like a, a broken-hearted lover gasping out his pain. Similar statement. Jerusalem, this, this was just a few days later. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, as Jesus leaves the temple for the last time, the one who kills the prophets and stones those sent to him. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. That word willing down there is exactly the same Greek word as wanted at the end of the second line. I wanted to gather you. You didn't want it. See, your house is left desolate. For I say to you, you will see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is looking ahead and he's saying, The lover you have chosen is going to hurt you and destroy you. And Jesus' heart is broken. Again, it's like the teenager. Uh, the parent is looking at their teen and saying, you're going to run off with who? Can't you see what that's going to result in? And all that teenager thinks is you're trying to be controlling and not let them have a life. And your heart is breaking. And they're looking back in anger. William Barclay, in one of his commentaries, said there, that there was no room in the end was symbolic of what, has, what was to happen to Jesus. The only place, place there was room for him was on the cross. He sought an entry to the overcrowded hearts of men. He could not find it, and still his search and his rejection go on. Can we be friends? He was despised. He was rejected by men, a man of sorrows, appointed with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. We didn't come and put our arms around him and say, I know you're hurting, I love you. We threw tomatoes. All we like sheep have gone astray. We all turned away. We've turned everyone to his own way. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers of silent. So he opened not his mouth. And yet his body language was continuing to say, his eyes were saying, Can we be friends? Do you love me? You know, typically as preachers, we try to get you to accept God's love from you. But I want to challenge you tonight is, does God need our love? And how are we doing at loving God? I never had any children, so I don't have the experience that many of you have had. I have to fall back on someone else's story. My cousin Lee, when he was 19, he left home to be independent. He drove away, said goodbye to his parents. It wasn't an angry party. But he was, he'd gotten a job at an apartment with a friend 500 miles away. He got in his Corvair van, if any of you remember those, and down the road he went. And a few days later, after he was beginning to discover that independence wasn't all that it was cracked up to be, remember that? He got a letter in the mail, in a blue envelope, and he could see the address, it was from his mom. And the letter said the following. How do you write to your firstborn son, who is on his first real soul flight? Well, you put it off because somehow he seems older than you are. It's past the time for maternal advice because he already knows almost everything about what you think pertaining to him. But he doesn't know the pain around his mother's heart as she watched him leave to become a man. 
Your mom wishes she could be there to pick you up when you fall and to encourage you to try again like she did when you were learning to walk. She wishes she could be there to tell you that you were missed. I miss seeing the awful mess all over the basement. Daddy put it in order today and now the place looks cold and unfriendly in a sterile sort of way. I guess I didn't prepare myself for your leaving like I should have. I just wouldn't think about it. Maybe you can't really think about it until it happens. I'm grateful that God gave you to me as a son and that you put up with us for these 19 years. I hope you won't quit. I wanted to write something really poetic or heavy, but the words just wouldn't come. This is not intended to make you homesick or get you to come home. It's really just therapy for your mother. I want you to know that I love you more than just saying I love you as you go out the door. I miss you, but I'm glad for your opportunity to grow and mature. And I appreciate the friend you were to me. I'm not sure I'm going to mail this letter, but it has been good for me to write my feelings and to even shed a few tears. Keep in touch, Lee. We need it more than you do. That last sentence is what got me. We need it more than you do. The parent watches the child drive away to enter into freedom and life. It's got to happen. The nest is emptying. And yet the parent wants to keep in touch. And all we think who drove away is that they want to keep a handle on us. No. About the time the teenager leaves home, the parents need the child's love more than the child needs the parent's love. And I believe God needs us loving Him as much or more than we need Him loving us. Jesus' death on Calvary was really Him saying, I would rather risk losing my eternity then face my eternity without any possibility of you being there. God sent Jesus. Jesus is God. Come to build a bridge. He didn't come to search and destroy. He didn't come with fire. He came with desire. He came to build a bridge. Took wood, three spikes and a hammer. And now he's standing out on that bridge saying, can we be friends? Do you love me? How do you say no to someone who has shown how badly he wants to be your friend? I remember the first time I actually heard Morty Vendon say that point, however he said it. How can you say no to someone who has shown in so many ways how badly he wants to be in a love relationship with you. How can we walk away from that kind of love? And yet we do it all the time. God knows what it's like for his beloved to break up and walk away. But what does he do? And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. By the way, look at that first line. You who are alienated and enemies. Get one thing real clear, folks. God is never an enemy towards us. We're throwing the tomatoes and they're all going one way. He's trying to love us. We're acting like the enemy. God is never the enemy. He's the friend that we're being enemies with. So when we were alienated and enemies, he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And you read that and you say, oh yes, yeah, that's what I got to do. If I'm going to come back to God, I've got to get holy and I've got to get blameless. No, no, no. What this is saying is he looks down at us and he says, I can see the potential there. And there's a lot of rubbish and there's a lot of stuff, but if we can clear that away, I made you to be a gorgeous, glorious, wonderful, talented. I have plans for you. And I want to clear everything away and have you become all that you were made to be. I want to make you gorgeous and glorious. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Jesus says, I want to make you all that you can be. But you keep getting distracted and wondering. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. Please, I want you to notice, God didn't send Jesus because he's mad at us. 
And Jesus is somehow going to placate his anger. God is Jesus. Come to reconcile us to himself. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He says, come on, I'm here. Let's get back in a relationship. And once you come back in the relationship with man, I want to send you out to get more people. We want to expand the circle of the relationship. We want to fix the original sin by bringing humanity back into the relationship. That is that God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. He's not up there saying, now you've done this, 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 and this, and until you get over that, you can't come home. No, he's up saying, I've already nailed all that to the cross. I foreknew all your sins, they're gone. Do you, do you realize something tonight, folks? There is not one sin between any person and on this earth and God tonight. Because sin was only handled once. And that was at the cross. That's why I believe in the foreknowledge of God. He foreknew my sins and took them to the cross 2,000 years ago. No matter how much you sin, you'll never surprise God because he already felt the pain of it. And he's already nailed it up. The only thing between any human being and God tonight is their perception, the lies they've been told, that there's something between them and God. God is standing as close as he can without violating your free will saying, can we be friends? Do you love me? Why don't you come home? I've made the way possible. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses. It's not about sin. It's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Go out and tell other people that I want to be friends. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ were pleading through us, we implore you in Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God is imploring. He's not berating. Can we be friends? The carpenter, he worked with wood. The things he built were strong and good. With his hands, he built a span that bridged the gap between God and man. What does Jesus say? I no longer call you servants. I call you what? Friends. friends. Notice, that's even better than being called kids or family. You have an obligation to family, right? You get together with family even when you don't like them. You love them, but you don't like them, right? But friends, you go just because you enjoy being with them. God says, I don't call you servants. You're not just slaves. I don't just call you family, obligation, filial love. I call you friends. Can we be friends? Do you love me? Do you know what it's like to be lonely? So lonely that none but your own thoughts are your companions. Do you know what it's like to be a kid in a household that nobody seems to understand? Do you know what it's like to be the kid that the rest of the children don't really want to play with and they leave you alone? Do you know what it's like to travel 80 miles to comfort a bereaved family and have them treat you like you're the one that caused the person to die? You know what it's like to feed a huge crowd of people and they come back the next day not because they're interested in you, but just because they want more food? You know what it's like to think you've found some people, at least a handful, who aren't ashamed to call you friends? And when you ask them to support you in prayer, they go to sleep. And they all disappear into the bushes when you're threatened. One betrays you to your enemies, another one denies with those that even knows you. You know what it's like? To have people dogging your steps, listening to everything you say, trying to find a reason to literally nail you. You know what it's like to have someone come to see you and come at night so nobody else will see you together. You know what it's like to come to your hometown, your home church, looking for friends and they want to throw you over a cliff. You know what it's like to be alone, rejected, left out, overlooked, hunted. To have your back torn apart by a leather strip with metal pieces in it. To have lost so much blood that you can't even carry a, a beam of wood, and when you fall, people just jeer, to be nailed, to have your body scream as they put that cross into the hole, and be hung naked before a crowd that are throwing rocks and insults, to labor to breathe, the death rattle in your breath, to have your eyes glaze over as death approaches, to exhale your last breath, knowing it is finished, and to die for people who refuse to be your friend. 
while on earth I believe Jesus longed for human companionship, and I don't even think his disciples understood. You know, most married couples that I've met admit that marriage has not quite lived up to all their dreams. Discover that marriage is hard? I like the phrase, marriage is hard, but it's worth it. You know, we men, we just don't get it. We serve, we provide, we fix, we buy, we do, we even maybe cook and clean. But she always wants more. And finally we say, well, what is it you want? I'm giving you everything I have. And she says, I want you. And we say, I don't know how to do that. Guys, how are you doing at loving your wife's heart? Have you ever asked her? Oh, now that's a scary one. I dare you. Sit down with your wife in a quiet moment, not when you've been arguing. And ask her, how am I doing at loving you? How are we doing at loving God? By the way, when I talk to men, they say the same thing but different, with different words. I think you ladies are, are better at loving us than we are at loving you, but there are still things I discover in, the, in us men that we wish you understood and that you could touch a little better. Somehow love never quite, in this world, in this fallen world, there are, there are impediments and the same thing happens with God. God looks at us and he says, do you love me? God has a lover's heart. How are we doing at loving God? I'd like God to take me deeper to where my relationship with Him is more than me needing His acceptance, His forgiveness, His salvation, His guidance, but where I'm actually ministering to His heart. Does God's heart need our love? How am I doing at loving God? How about my daily time with Jesus? Is it just about me getting in the time so that I'll have a good relationship with Him and I'll know the right theology and I'll get to heaven and I'll have a good life? Do I actually get up in the morning to spend time with Him because He wants my presence? What is the great commandment? Teacher, what's the great commandment in the Lord? This is the number one. What is it? And what is the great commandment? God says, for you to love me. That's the number one commandment. It's not to be good. It's not to stop sinning. It's not to get rid of all that bad behavior. The number one commandment is to love God. He wants our love. And by the way, when we're loving Him, we'll be, we'll be loving our neighbors well. Amen? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons, we've done wonders in your name. And what does he say? I don't think we ever got acquainted. Who are you? We're not friends. Can we be friends? It all comes down to becoming friends with God. And this is eternal life, that they may what? No. Here you have the definition of eternal life. This is it. And it doesn't say anything about good or bad behavior, repentance, confession, or any of all that stuff we talked about. If you know Jesus, that's evidently the epitome. The first command is to love Him. Again, God is not primarily concerned that we behave, that we obey, and that we be good. He's primarily concerned that we return to the love relationship that we fell out of in the garden. Daily time with Jesus alone. If we don't have that, dare I say, we ain't got nothing. If we don't have time to spend time loving God back, we don't have much of a relationship. And we haven't solved the original sin, which was the breakup at the tree. I like this verse. It's always has intrigued me. In the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, and it was their names, Barnabas, Simeon, Niger, Lucius, and Manan, and Saul. And notice that next sentence. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, I find that sentence to be very interesting. It doesn't say as God ministered to them. Why do you come to church? We often say, well, I came to church, I didn't get anything out of it. 
Because we came to church to have God and others minister to us. Here it says, they were hanging out in church fasting and praying, not so God would minister to them, but they were ministering to the Lord. How do you do that? Relationship, time, focus, attention. People say, I didn't get much out of church. What if you came to church tomorrow and you got absolutely nothing out of it but God got some loving? Would that be worth it? And by the way, if God gives some loving, you'll get more than you can stand. You're not going to go home empty. What God is looking to do is fire up the romance that we threw cold water on in the Garden of Eden. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come to him and dine with him and eat with me. I've always looked at that verse. It seems, you know, that I'm in need of Jesus. And he comes by because you need me, you know, and I'll bring what you need. And yet he's knocking at the door saying, I got the food. Do you have the time? I love to do lunch. I don't know about you guys, but I, I love to do lunch. You know, somebody wants to talk, let's do lunch, right? We get some food, and we spend some time together, and we talk, and that's God here. He's saying, man, can we do lunch? I want to spend some time with you. It's not just that you need me, but I want you. I love you. Can we be friends? Jesus knocks at the door. He wants to come in and dine. He's not just there for our sakes. He's there for his sake, too. He's saying, I need it more than you do. Do you love me? Can we be friends? This week, we're going to commit our time, meeting after meeting, to talking about a relationship with Jesus. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to come day after day. Not just for your sake, but for his sake. I believe if we gather together this week for the purpose of loving God, we'll get more than we can handle. Press down, shaking together, and running on. Now you know what's going to happen. If I was going to spend this week preaching on all the sins you need to quit doing, Satan would probably help you get here. Because he knows with that focus he'll eventually win. But he hates Jesus. He hates God. And he hates it when people give God love. And if we get together for the next week to give God some loving, you're going to have three flat tires. Your kids are going to be cranky. You're going to be cranky. Something's going to happen to try to keep you from coming. And I want to encourage you to just decide if you have to crawl here, you're going to come. And we're going to give God some love. And we're going to talk about Him. We're going to spend time with Him. And we're going to learn how to be friends. We're going to learn how important it is for us to be friends of His. For our sake, for His sake. Because that is really what Jesus is saying. Can we be friends? The original sin is that when we chose to break up with God, the original solution is not to fix our behavior, but to restore that relationship. The original sin, breaking up with God, led to horrendous behavior. May I suggest the solution isn't to change your behavior. The solution is we work on the relationship. And if the relationship gets fixed, just as the byproduct of a broken relationship was broken behavior, the byproduct of a restored relationship will be restored behavior. All right? That's what we're going to talk about for this week. Can we be friends? How do we be friends with God? Let's pray. Jesus, it is a little hard for us to think of God needing us. Oh, I think we think of you needing us. You need us to witness. You need us to, you know, do all kinds of things. And we go out and try to do stuff for you. But it's hard for us to get through our minds that the thing you really want is just for us to be in love with you. And that's going to fix everything for you, for us, and for the world. So Jesus, as we commit ourselves this week to loving you, and to talking about loving you, and being in love with you, 
Would you come and minister to our hearts and would you let us experience what it means to minister to your heart? May we become deep, close, and intimate friends by spending this time together this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.